Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors Podcast, with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Welcome back to the next episode of The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors, with the wonderful Mr. Bob Cook um, and myself, Jackie Jones. And what we're going to be talking about in this episode, which is episode 123, is empowerment and self-agency, important goals in the therapy process. Jackie, they're the most important goals in the therapy process that you will ever have. Yes, I agree. And uh, let's take self-agency. And what we mean by self-agency. So self-agency, if you looked it up in Wikipedia or from a psychological perspective, means um, the promotion of action. And it means actually the the movement of action so in other words you can feel yourself assertive in your head but until you are until you do an assertive action like standing up to your school teacher or standing up to your colleague whatever then then it stays in your head so self-agency is the ability to externalize actions So in other words, you, a, th- a client can come into therapy highly motivated. He can do lots of educative therapy about what I need to do to develop self-resilience, what I need to do to stand up to somebody who bullies me. But for, before you to actually do that demands agency. Yeah. demand something to happen yeah yeah and I think that's one of the things that often doesn't happen we we learn how to do things we learn how to be mindful we learn how to to do all this stuff but then we don't actually do anything with it that's right and then we wonder why nothing changes <laughs> our sense of agency is limited yeah and I think it's so important to give permission or help with help a client in the uh, in the area in the arena of agency yeah because otherwise they may use intellectualization or passivity as a major defense against anything happening yeah so in that respect when we with clients do you set homework or goals or okay things here we go to do yeah so according to what type of therapist you are so i if i had a guess with you jackie that you're somebody who probably does set i don't particularly like the word homework but i will stay with homework at the moment things for them to do outside the psychotherapy session is that correct yes yeah even if it's just to get curious about the behavior yeah I, 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 and i think that's great by the way i like the idea of um people practicing some of the things that they learned in psychotherapy in the real world yeah then coming back and talking about how they got on yeah i really think that's a really positive part of people integrating new behaviors and coping mechanisms in fact without that bit that you're just talking about there um Therapy might not actually happen. In other words, it might just stay as an idea. Yeah. Or it may stay in the world of the therapy room, but nothing actually happens, if that makes sense. Absolutely. See, I know I've mentioned this in the past, but the reason why I loved the training that I did at MIP was because of that self-agency. We we were still in training, but practising. Mm so that's we were kind of learning about it but then doing it at the same time yeah you were practicing how to do competencies and then you've got a placement and you've got a client yeah practice the things that you learned actually with clients and it's like an old what i had in the 60s and 
70s apprentice style learning yeah absolutely where you would do, do things on the job yeah yeah i learned to, i i was a hairdresser that was my first job and i was a, an apprentice oh. hairdresser so i, I went to college that. one day a week and the other four days i was in a salon wow so yeah i never knew that about you well there you go you learn something that i never learned like you said something to me on facebook Oh, off air or somewhere. That's another thing you learned about me. I can't remember what it was, but there's a thing I've learned about it's about you. horses. You oh yeah, horses. trained horses. Yeah, polo horses. Yes, never knew that. So yeah, I used <laughs> to be a hairdresser. So there you go. There we go. Yes, yeah, so again, back. I I think the last video, if I remember, was on integrative psychotherapy. Now, in the in the in the psychotherapy sequence. You need to help people integrate new behaviors in the real world. Yeah. And then bring it back and discuss how they got on. Now, in that process, not only will you promote integration, but you will promote active self agency. Yeah. So I'm a great fan of that, what you just talked about. Yeah. Um, but the bit is that you talk about it afterwards, it doesn't get lost. You know, so. I always used to say this when I trained psychotherapists. Uh, if you are going to be this type of therapist, it needs to be followed up. Yeah. So if you're going to set them things to do, you have to jot it down in your notebook or your memory or somewhere to check up the following week how they've got on. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. That's you something... I say to clients as well about, you know, a lot of people like journaling, they write things down. And I always say to them, do you ever go back and reflect on it? Because just writing <laughs> stuff down and putting it in a book and putting it away isn't going to do anything. You need to go back and reflect on it and see if there's a pattern and, you know, that sort of stuff. Absolutely. I, I used to keep way back before I was <laughs> laughing to myself, way before as a therapist from about, I don't know what age, I don't know, 26, 27. I used to keep diaries, these big Collins, Collins diaries. Yeah. Where you would have a huge, each of the Collins diaries had big pages. And I, so I, I, I remember finding 21 or 22 years of these Collins, wow. <laughs> these Collins diaries. Um, and I stopped doing them when I I think when I met Stephanie I'd done a lot of therapy as well so life was a lot better I look back at these diaries and they were full of doom and gloom and negativity and I sort of knew that was my history but with the therapy and surrounding myself with people who were more healthy I sort of didn't recognize part of myself yeah wow that must have been really interesting and moving yeah absolutely i was thinking as you were saying that how you now as a therapist would have been with you then <laughs> if that yes. makes sense if, if oh, you totally. both be in a room together how yeah. how interesting yeah. yeah totally and i got rid of quite a few diaries because they were so negative yeah so doom laden that i couldn't bear to have that as part of my history anymore wow I've probably only got two or three of those diaries left now, or three or four. Yeah. So I think that if you are going to set homework or behaviours as new coping mechanisms or whatever it is for clients to practice integrating their life, you need to follow it up. Yeah. Because so many therapists, I mean, I, I know this through supervision, they set homework, but because but then they don't follow it up. Yeah. And I say, well, do you think they did it? Yeah. Uh, well, um, well, we never really followed up. Well, why didn't we? Why didn't you follow it up? Oh, um, oh, other things came along. We just concentrated on. Yeah. Or if they were honest, they might say, well, they forgot, perhaps, or yeah, something like that. But I think it's a great detriment if you don't follow it up. Yeah, it's a loss experience it's a lost learning experience or whatever it is yeah absolutely i must admit i do make it a note of it because my memory isn't the best so i do make a note oh, of it good good 
Good. And, and even if they come back with some burning thing that they want to do mm. in that session at some point, I will just refer to it, even if it's, I know you don't want to talk about it this week, but we need to catch up on yeah. whatever it was that you did. Yeah, I, rem- I remember, because I ran many, many groups, by the way, Jackie. Perhaps this is for another podcast around tales of psychotherapy. Room. Perhaps I'll use this, but I'll briefly mention this here. I used to um, or put it in the homework bracket, if you like, um, with some clients who had had difficulties having healthy relationships. Um, and they had so many red flags uh, that they missed the red flags because of their history. So yeah. as we worked through all this and dealt with the red flags, I said, OK, well, find a shopping list of the qu- top qualities you would like for a healthy partner. Yeah. Day six. Yeah. And then, we, we, and usually we, they, they, they found that very hard. But when we got six healthy qualities, I said, okay, now go away and practice looking for this type of person. That's and really talk interesting. About in the next two weeks, how you've got on. Yeah. And amazingly, amazingly, because I did go back in two weeks' time, they often reported. Well, I've actually found somebody with at least two of those three of those qualities. That's really good. <laughs> because sometimes, especially in the dating game, I, I've got quite a few clients or whatever that have been dating and they're just wandering around aimlessly. <laughs> and, it, you know, now that it's all online and it's just a swiping thing, it, it's... Well, you see, Jackie, two things. One, they don't know what they're looking for. Yeah. And B, they're often operating from... A, an older script which yeah. is based on red flags basically yeah so they and there's a lot of therapy before that homework but it's, okay. a, it's a homework i get quite a lot and I, I i smile because i've had quite a few marriages oh that, look at uh, you <laughs> in the last 38 years i'm sure a bit of a cupid it may or may not have come from that homework so, so I'm a great believer going, in their work. Going back to the topic anyway, the self-agency. And well, that's self-agency, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Putting it into practice, yeah, yeah. yeah. And empowerment comes with that. There's yeah. nothing more empowering than taking action positively. Yeah. yeah. I don't mean taking action negatively, which confirms a script. I mean taking action positively, which backs up a new script, a yeah. new script on the road. Nothing more empowering than that, is there? No, no, no. And they come together. Even even doing it and it not working out is still self-agency. Do you know what I mean? It's doing yeah. some, pushing our comfort zone and doing yeah. something different. So it's yeah. not negative, yeah. even if it doesn't work out, if that makes sense. It makes complete sense. So if we take empowerment, now, you know, empowerment, there's a continuum of empowerment. But, you know, how can I explain this? But people come right at the beginning of therapy who might be depressed, they may be withdrawn, they might be passive, they may have a very unhappy life, they may have XXX. So empowerment might be, right at the beginning, a new awareness yeah, that they hadn't actually been aware of before. Oh, actually, I hadn't realised that I could do this. Or I hadn't realised that it was okay for me to express feelings. Yeah, That's empowerment in itself, I think, because yeah. what's starting to happen is you've got a germ of a new awareness that might lead to other things. So though we haven't perhaps got to what we just talked about a moment ago, which is the development of the self-agency with that, but I do think the awareness of new like new sprouts coming along. Yeah. The awareness of new parts of ourselves or the new, the awareness of new new aspects of ourselves or the awareness of, well, I didn't actually think about it that way. That in itself, I think, can be very empowering. Absolutely. Just that thought of possibility, mm. that, that it's yeah. possible for me to do this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That hope could, that hope actually exists. Yeah. Now, is there anything more, anything more or less empowering than the belief of hope yeah. that actually we can change, that we don't have to stay in our own misery? We can actually 
change things. Yeah. Now that's empowering, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. How you get there, how you get there from the place of believing uh that life is pointless, life is despairing, that you have no value, everybody's got out to get to you is another story. Yeah. Yeah. But the development of that idea, that possibility you've just said there, Jackie. And to grasp hold of it, even if it's just just for the first time, is so empowering. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, when that when you were talking then about the, the sprouts of something, you know, instead of having that why me and woe is me attitude to, to having why not me in in a positive way. You know, when we, we compare ourselves yes. to others and they've got everything yes. and I've got nothing. And it's just having that one thought of, well, why not me? If if they can do it, why can't I, I do it? Me. Yeah. And that is so empowering. And the client comes back and this has happened many, 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 many times. They come back the next week and say, because I often have check in in groups, particularly I'm thinking of here. Yeah. And I have some positive news and they come back. I just want to say that. Since last week, I've started to believe that things perhaps can change. Yeah. How empowering is that? Yeah. Even if that... Because that's the first step. That Nothing else can happen unless there's that part of us that believes that change can happen. Because if we go into therapy thinking change can't happen, there's no point being in therapy, really. And the therapist needs to be a therapist, I believe, that promotes empowerment, yeah, and promotes the possible and promotes explicitly the possibility of change, yeah, not reinforce the opposite somehow, yeah, yeah. Because I think at times I don't want to say I've overstepped the mark, but I can be quite firm with my clients when they keep coming back with the same things. <laughs> you know to be and it's kind of like well we can talk about the same things but unless you go out and take action nothing is going to change that's right so that is very common you don't you move past that. the talking ah, get yeah, onto yeah. the doing yeah. <laughs> yeah that what you just said there is probably the most common process in psychotherapy where you have been working with the client over the same thing the same thing the same thing the same thing, and it seems nothing changes. Yeah. That's when a therapist needs to change tack. Yeah, yeah. They need to look at what is underneath the process that the person is so stuck. Yeah. If the therapist doesn't change tack, nothing will happen. I think I maybe changed tack by just bringing it into the room and saying something about it. Yeah, that, well, that's the first. It's really familiar. I'm sure that we've discussed this before. <laughs> uh, yeah, know. and are you sabotaging yourself by, or are we sabotaging, <laughs> in some processes, are we doing that, by going over the same process and process again? Perhaps what we need to look at is what is underneath the surface yeah. stopping you, empowering yourself or taking action. Yeah. But unless the therapist thinks developmentally, by the way, then that might not happen. If you've got a therapist that just stays in the here and now and doesn't think of developmental deficits and developmental traumas and fragmentation of the self as reason why the person stays stuck, yeah, then we have another story, I think. Yeah. It's all very interesting. It's, it's, it, as... as always for me in in the therapy room it's different layers There's yes literally always. layers <laughs> yeah. yeah and the bit is and the bit jackie is where you stop where both of you stop in other words if you're a long-term developmental relation psychotherapist and that's where the client wants to go then you, there's a whole process which involves if you're a short-term psychotherapist working with focused you know, shorter goals and outcomes are focused or whatever it is, then you have a different type of therapy. But in, I spent 39 years or 38 years working developmentally through the layers, the way you're talking, because yeah. that's the type of therapist I was. I contracted with clients for that and I was trained for that. Yeah. 
that doesn't mean all therapy has to be like that. You can, it can no, be short and... term, you can stay on the surface, you can still yeah. do work. I For think me, it seems to be both. I'll see some clients on a short term basis. But then in six months, 12 months time, they'll get back in touch with me and they want to come back and come then back. kind of go down a bit deeper and then they'll go off and then they come back. And every time it's like another layer, but they don't do it all in one go. No, you can never do all this in one go. Yeah, It's, it's great that they come back, shows a great sense of motivation and self-agency to take action to come back. Absolutely, yeah. So I think empowerment and self-agency go together. Actually, they're part of the same process. And I'm so pleased that we've done this episode, Bob, because for me, it's a positive thing that we do in therapy. You know, sometimes therapy can feel quite heavy and, and all that sort of stuff. But empowering our clients and, and encouraging them to, to take action for me is a, the really positive part of it. Mm, absolutely it's not not all just sitting and talking about things we do encourage them to give permission validation encouragement all the really important parts of the world of psychotherapy absolutely yeah and that fires that gives me a fire in my belly that that stuff that's what that's the part of my job that i love Mm. well good for you and me as well when this you know getting feedback from it when they yeah. say, you know, what we this, what we did in that session last week has really encouraged me to go out and do this. It's like, yes. Yeah, and that's empowerment. And that's actually, you know, the, the, the development of self-agency as well. That's why I say they go together. Yeah. They're the, you know, they're some of the hallmarks of, a, you know, where psychotherapists are helping people go to take charge and to change things and to to really take ownership and destiny of their own lives yeah Yeah. that's wonderful when that happens so bob thank you and what we're going to be talking about next time is learning from clients in the therapy room you kind of touched on tales from the therapy room so we've given it a bit of a a different slant (laughs) And yeah. I'm really looking forward to listening to some of your tales from the therapy room. <laughs> yeah, and, I, I, and also I'm looking forward to you bringing some as well. I've, I've got quite a few. I mean, they're all confidential, so they'll be wrapped Absolutely. up in different ways. But I think that if we asked any therapist, they could all talk about their own learnings, I hopefully, uh, from the psychotherapy room. One of the best writers for people listening, just a moment, is Yalom. Y A L O M, Irvin Yalom. He's about 93 now. He's still got a couple of clients. Wow. And he's written many, many books. I would think he's probably one of the finest, finest existential psychotherapists I know. His first book, and I think he's written many, was um Love it was called Love's Executioner. And it was Tales from the Psychotherapy Room. And then he went on to write books like Um Staring into the Sun and Oh, I've got I've probably got 10 or 11 here. But um, Yalom, please, anybody interested in existential psychotherapy or learnings um, from the therapy room, uh, by, by, by his first book, which I think is really good, is, you know, Love's Executioner. And it, it, it will not be expensive, but you will love it. I'm going to go and have a look for that now. You must, you must be able to write an encyclopedia on this, Bob. I felt very envious the other day because one of my supervisees who is a well, well, been a therapist for a very long time and he's, he's been a supervisee of mine for many, many years. He talked about how, I don't know how long he's been a psychotherapist, but a long time. So I was amazed when he said this. He says, oh, I've, I've, I've kept all the notes from all my clients. I said, what do you mean? He said, oh, well, I, I always jot down a lot of notes uh, far more than me, by the way. And I said, well, where are they? This is sort of back 20 or 30 years of therapy. She said in a box. I said, well, you'll be able to write uh, your your existential book then, won't you? Your own learnings from the client or something like that. Mine, unfortunately, the nuances of what I'm talking about here are in my head. So I'd probably have to have a hypnotherapy session to start getting some of these out. Or another way to do it 
would be to talk to with you for an hour offline or something before. So it triggers all these memories. I think what I'm going to have to do before this podcast is do a bit of meditating and re to remember some of the learnings. I think remembering it is far better than looking through a book and the notes that you've took because that's more personable to me. Yes, that's a nice take. On Sometimes it. I don't need the facts. I just need to get the feeling for what's going on and that feels better for me. So don't go and write it all down, Bob. Just meditate and let it come up. <laughs> anyway, I look forward to next week. Until next week, Bob. Thank you so much. Yeah, bye-bye. Take care, bye. Bye. You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.